Well, good afternoon. This is a fantastic start uh, to our annual colloquium series. Um, for those of you who haven't been to a colloquium before, typically the format is about 40 minutes or so, ho however long it takes the presenter to uh, read or talk their paper, and then we'll have a short break and time for questions. So this afternoon, as you know, we have the privilege of having Dr. Ortland um, tell us who Leviathan is. So I'm looking forward to finding out. I haven't taken a peek at his paper yet. So uh, Eric, do you want to come up? And I'll pray for you as we get started. Father, thank you for uh, your goodness to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for, um, for a community of scholarship and for the delight that we can find in digging into your word and for Eric and uh, the study that he has done on this topic. And we ask for your presence with us this afternoon and your blessing on our time together, on Eric as he presents, and on our interaction after. Pray this for your sake. Amen. I'm really flattered that people would actually, you know this is a paper on Leviathan, right? <laughs> <laughs> you weren't expecting like a free lunch or something? Okay, well, I'm really flat. Anytime you have something like this and more than, more than the, the presenter shows up, that's, a, that's always a good, good thing. So this will only take like four hours tops, so <laughs> we should be out of here in time for dinner. Uh, the, my, my paper's titled the, Identi uh, the Identity of Leviathan and the Meaning of the Book of Job. Interpretation of the figure of Leviathan at the end of the Book of Job splits neatly into two groups. The majority opinion understands Leviathan to be a natural creature, probably a crocodile. On the other hand, a few commentators take Leviathan to be a primeval supernatural evil on a par with the divine or semi-divine monsters described in ancient Near Eastern myth. I'd like to argue that this latter interpretation is correct on two grounds. First, taking Leviathan as a supernatural monster fits better and fits perfectly with every other place Leviathan is actually mentioned. I can't find anywhere else where Leviathan is clearly just a crocodile. Second, this interpretation shows how Yahweh directly and clearly answers Job complaint, Job's complaint concerning Yahweh's unjust treatment of him, or at least the accusation of injustice. Briefly, I understand Yahweh in referencing this terrible monster to be speaking within Job's cultural context in order to communicate to him that there is an unimaginable evil at loose in the world which Yahweh promises to defeat, but which Yahweh has not yet defeated. Stated negatively, if the Leviathan whom Yahweh describes in Job 40 and 41 is only a crocodile, then, then the Leviathan we find there is in tension with his presence everywhere else and it also renders the conclusion of the book of Job ambiguous at best. The argument proceeds in two stages. First, we'll look at every other mention of Leviathan in the ancient Near East and the Old Testament. Uh, and it'll be argued that the figure is always a supernatural power. We're going to go quite quickly through that part of the paper. Second, Job itself will be discussed. The argument there centers around three issues. First, a naturalistic interpretation of Leviathan fails adequately to distinguish Yahweh's two speeches. It's not even clear why Yahweh would need a second speech if he's only talking about a crocodile. Second, a naturalistic interpretation of Leviathan fails to account for the change in Job's response to Yahweh. His response to the first speech is to go, you're right, I'm wrong, I didn't know what I was talking about, assuming all of you could hear me. He, do, he, he says, I put my hand over my mouth. By the end of the second speech, he's repenting in dust and ashes and despising himself, and he's saying, I, now my eyes see you. If it's only a crocodile, it's hard to know why Job does that. Third, naturalistic interpretation renders Yahweh's response to Job murky at best and fails to provide a satisfying conclusion to the debate in the book. Now, if any of you are following along with the paper I sent out, we're just going to 
skim through the first six pages really quickly. There's a reference to Leviathan in the Ugaritic Baal epic. It's clearly a supernatural monster there. Interestingly, some of the monsters that the, that the, that the god Baal fights are described as animals, and yet they're clearly more than just animals, you know? Um, there, there, there's not much discussion around that issue in Le with regard to Leviathan's presence in the Baal epic. Um, the, I mentioned ancient Near Eastern myth earlier. I, I hope it's clear that in referencing that and in talking about Leviathan in the Bible, I am in no way implying that the Bible is just a myth or something. I'm going to try to stay away from that word because it's ambiguous. It means different things. I, I rejoice to, to affirm the absolute historical reliability of the Bible in all things. I, I found a quote from Martin Paul, helpful in this regard. He writes that while in the Old Testament, while in the Old Testament, monotheism is incompatible with the belief that the dragon and the sea are gods, it is compatible with the belief that they represent demonic forces, which often appear portrayed in animal form in the ancient world. That's helpful. That's a helpful perspective when we talk about Leviathan in the Bible. Really briefly, there are two important references to Leviathan in Psalm 74 and Isaiah 21. I can't find anyone who thinks it's a crocodile there, but the Jewish rabbis uh, and some modern commentators follow them understand Leviathan in those texts to be a symbol for the human king, specifically the king of Egypt or the king of Babylon. It's not a crazy interpretation. In Psalm 74, you can find echoes in that text back to the Song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15 where they praise God for uh, exodusing them out of uh, Egypt. It's not implausible to think of the, the dragon in the sea as being a symbol for the king of Egypt there. At the same time, there's stuff in Psalm 74 that doesn't fit there, so uh, right after smashing the heads of Leviathan, it talks about how uh, God established the light and the sun. He divided up the boundaries of the earth and springtime and harvest and so on. That didn't happen at the Exodus. Uh, on the other hand, if we, if we allow Leviathan room to be a cosmic monster, if we give cosmic scope to this psalm, then it makes perfect sense for the, for the poet to move from celebrating Yahweh's defeat of Leviathan to talking about creation. There are similar issues in Isaiah 27.1 uh, and a similar argument to be made. There's a reference to Leviathan in Job chapter 3, which for this paper is quite easy. It's clearly not a crocodile there. Job is calling for the dissolution of creation in Job chapter 3. After what happened to him, he just says, let's just stop all of this. Uh, in verse 8, when he, he is cheering on Leviathan in Leviathan's desire to undo creation, it's clearly more than just a monster there. I think for the sake of time, there, there's a reference to Leviathan in Psalm 104, where I, I suppose I might as well read it. it, it, it the, the psalmist says, how many are your works, O Lord, in verse 24? All of them you've made in wisdom. The earth is full of your creations. There's the sea, great and wide, and all the, cre all the creatures which teem in it without number, beasts small with great. There the ships go, and Leviathan, whom you formed to play in it. So here... Leviathan is having a bath, playing with his rubber ducky, having a great time. Uh, it's kind of weird the way he's portrayed. I, I, I'm still suspicious that this is not a crocodile here, not just an animal. The reason being Hebrew had other ways to talk about merely a big sea creature. There's the dog Gadol, the big fish from Jonah. Uh, there's the Tani Nim from Psalm 148 that just mean big sea creatures. I wonder why the poet didn't pick one of those terms as opposed to Lewitanu, as opposed to Leviathan. I wonder if the poet is aware of Leviathan's reputation, and he assumes we are too. And it's, it, it's, as, it's as if the poet is saying, creation is so good, even Leviathan is good to the extent that he is one of God's creatures. To the extent that, that Leviathan rebels against God, he's not good. But in Psalm 104, all the emphasis is on the former. We can talk about that more if you want to. Uh, page six of the paper. 
starting in the middle of things. We're now in a position to turn to the Bible's longest de description of Leviathan. It can already be stated at this stage in the argument that if Yahweh refers only to a crocodile in his second speech to Job, his use of this figure is exceptional. And you all are sort of taking that on faith right now. But we can talk about that more if you want to. But this consideration alone doesn't render a naturalistic reading of this passage impossible to see why this might be the case, to see why Leviathan might still be a crocodile in Job. Let's briefly consider the first divine speech, chapters 38 to 39. Yahweh finally appears on the scene in chapter 38, verse 1, using wisdom terminology to enter the debate on its own terms. Yahweh begins by claiming that Job has been darkening Eitzah, counsel or plan, in chapter 38, verse 2. Yahweh doesn't specify whose plan this is or what the plan is about, but he spends the entirety of chapters 38 to 39 talking about creation. As a result, it's likely that the counsel Yahweh refers to in chapter 38, verse 2, is his own counsel as he rules over creation. Yahweh claims that Job has been darkening or obscuring Yahweh's particular manner of governing creation. This is, in fact, exactly what Job has been doing. Given Job's experience in chapters 1 to 2, Job mistakenly, if understandably, concludes that Yahweh must be bungling his role as ruler of the world. As Job says in chapter 9, God destroys both the blameless and the wicked. It's all one. Yahweh's response to Job's accusation in chapters 38 to 39 has three clear, if unstated, implications. First. Yahweh wants Job to understand that the world is much more vast and complex than Job has realized. Job's conclusion that Yahweh is mismanaging his job as manager of the cosmos on the basis of Job's own tragedy is an unwarranted inference. As Michael Fox says, however badly things went in Job's case, he must realize that the world is not run by a fool. Second, God isn't the cosmic destroyer, as Job has claimed. Job will more than once portray God as a big bully. That's, then, now, that's wrong, but it's understandable given what happened to Job. This is incorrect, according to chapters 38 to 39. There's a great deal of order and good in creation. Third, God implies that there are some chaotic elements in creation which Yahweh allows to exist within certain limits. God will refer to different predators, the ostrich, you know, the charging war horse and other animals. Yahweh's manner of governing the world is to allow these chaotic and sinister elements to exist, but allowing them to exist doesn't count as a mismanagement of creation. Job responds in chapter 40 by withdrawing his complaint against God and his rule over creation. He admits he didn't know what he was talking about when he portrayed God as a cosmic tyrant. This all too brief summary of chapters 38 to 39 puts us in a position to best appreciate the naturalistic interpretation of Behemoth and Leviathan in chapters 40 to 41. Simply, according to the, briefly, according to this reading, Yahweh moves from creation as a whole in chapters 38 to 39 to focus on two specific parts of creation, the hippopotamus and the crocodile. But to what end? Yahweh's first speech clearly engages with key elements in Job's complaint, but it's hardly a complete answer. After all, pointing to the complexity and goodness of creation, along with occasionally sinister elements within it, doesn't explain why, Job allow, why God allowed all of Job's children to die in one day. The issue of unjust and disproportionate suffering remains unresolved. Was it just of God to allow his favorite servant to be treated this way? And is Job right to be holding on to his faith in Yahweh? Or should Job give up on God? The stakes are high for Yahweh at this point. The partial answer of chapters 38 to 39 is clear, but it only goes so far. What does Yahweh say to Job in his speech about Leviathan? Commentators who understand a crocodile to be of view in chapters 40 to 41 tend to answer this question by pointing to divine power. According to this reading, Yahweh is implicitly drawing attention to his own power and mastery as he describes this untamable beast. Uh, Job, according to one commentator, Job is powerless before this animal and only God can subdue it. 
Robert Alden writes that since Job could be killed by a crocodile, Job's only choice was to trust and obey Yahweh. Francis Anderson similarly claims that God's superior strength to Leviathan is meant to evoke trust from humans that he's able to govern the universe. Several vulnerabilities hamper this interpretation, which I suppose is a polite way of saying this is hard to believe for several reasons. First, if Yahweh's second speech is not in principle different from the first, if it only focuses more specifically on two animals within creation, it's not clear why the speech is given at all. Job has already withdrawn his complaint of cosmic mismanagement. If Job had dug in his heels and continued to argue, it makes sense for Yahweh to repeat his case, specifying on two specific parts of creation. But since Job has already yielded, one wonders what else Job can say except to repeat that he spoke out of turn. What response is Yahweh hoping for in giving a second speech? Related to this is the fact that Job's response to this second speech is strikingly different from his first response. He claims he's seen God in a new way and he despises himself. It's striking that although Yahweh has been theophanically present, that is visibly present, from the storm since chapter 38 verse 1, Job only claims to have seen him until after the second speech. Um, If Behemoth and Leviathan are only a crocodile and a hippo, hard to imagine why Job responds this way. A second problem uh, uh, with a naturalistic interpretation. Job never denied Yahweh's power, the supposed subject of Yahweh's speech about this crocodile. Job's already quoted speech in chapter 9 is only one example of Job's unchanging acknowledgement of divine power. But if the descriptions of the powers of Behemoth and Leviathan are meant to highlight Yahweh's might, then Yahweh's trying to convince Job of something that Job never denied. Related to this, the issue of the justice in in God's treatment of Job and God's trustworthiness doesn't fare well in this interpretation. A tyrant describing his power might be impressive, but a simple claim to power does not demonstrate a tyrant's justice or trustworthiness. In fact, at different points in Job's speeches, Yahweh's power seems to add to Job's terror of God. Third, a naturalistic interpretation can't make sense out of the imagery of the divine warrior with which Yahweh introduces his descriptions of Behemoth and Leviathan. (coughs) Yahweh talks about the divine arm and the thunderous voice and the splendor and majesty with which he quotes himself. Other passages in the Old Testament, Psalm 29, Habakkuk 3, Psalm 89, This is always talked about before Yahweh engages in battle with chaos. It's as if Yahweh shows up to talk with Job dressed in full battle armor, sword out, holding a spear. But if this is only a crocodile, why does Yahweh need to get all dressed up? In fact, David Kleins, who goes with the naturalistic interpretation of Leviathan, claims that there's no close connection between the Behemoth speech and its introduction in chapter 40, verses 9 through 14. Fourth, if Yahweh only describes animals in this speech, he dodges the question of justice. God might be just in allowing the physical and animal realm to contain some sinister elements, but what about the moral realm? What about the treatment of his servants? It's significant that some proponents of the naturalistic interpretation of Leviathan admit this very fact. David Kleins, for instance who understands the intention of the second divine speech to be plainly the same, quote unquote, as the first and the function of the animals to be the same, writes that the second speech refuses the categories of the dialogues, especially with regard to the question of God's justice in his particular manner of governing creation. According to Kleins, the question of justice in Job's case is simply not addressed. Little wonder then that Kleins sees the deity in this chapter as, quote, unlovely, and not a little chilling, and too interested in crocodiles. John Gammy is another interpreter of Job who argues eloquently for a naturalistic interpretation, and he understands the emphasis of speech to be divine power. Like Kleins, he also states that instead of explaining his treatment of Job, God avoids the question and makes a bald assertion of authority. God pulls rank. According to Gami, the answer which the divine speeches give to suffering is the might and ordering power of God, and that's it. 
Gammy and Habel don't criticize God the way Klein's does. It is, however, difficult not to find fault with the deity who, imagines, who, who allows such unimaginable levels of suffering and then refuses to engage with the questions of a servant who has imperfectly but genuinely trusted him throughout the ordeal. It's difficult to see how a naturalistic interpretation of Leviathan can avoid reading the book of Job in such a way that it ends in a frustrating anticlimax with an untrustworthy God. But this dead end in the interpretation of Job is not inevitable. If we understand Yahweh to, refer to, to be referring to an evil supernatural power, which Yahweh alone can defeat in harmony with every other reference to Leviathan, then the implications of the second speech become clear. First, Yahweh is showing Job that there's a supernatural evil at work in the world. Job is not suffering because he sinned, and not all suffering is to be attributed to human wrongdoing, which is a clear rebuke to the theology of the friends. Second, Yahweh is acknowledging how greatly Job has suffered. Indeed, Yahweh may even be implying that Job has suffered more than Job realized. J Yahweh is saying to Job, listen, Job, you've been caught up in a war in heaven. You thought I was just picking on you. Something much vaster has been going on that you've been caught up in. Third, and most crucially, Yahweh is hinting that he will eventually defeat this evil. The coming battle is admittedly only a hint in these speeches. We'll return to that point below. But in chapter 40, verse 19, it says, Behemoth's maker brings near his sword. And in chapter 40, verse 32, Yahweh speaks of a battle which far outstrips Job's imagination. Even if this conflict isn't given elaborate uh, description in the second divine speech, Yahweh does acknowledge that there's a fearsome evil at loose in his creation. He also promises one day to defeat it. This is Yahweh's particular manner of ruling over creation. He allows these monsters continued existence, but not forever. Uh, Alan, would it be possible to open the door back there? There's a lot of hot air coming from the front of the room, so it's getting kind of warm in here. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. Of course, this isn't a complete answer. Yahweh doesn't explain everything to Job. Job doesn't know when this battle will, ha will happen, and he learns nothing about the debate in heaven and the accusation of the Satan at the beginning of the book, which started all this. Furthermore, Yahweh doesn't definitively silence every objection. A reader might push back and still question the justice of God in allowing this evil to exist at all. One might insist that the only just way to govern the cosmos is to annihilate all evil immediately instead of allowing it some limited agency. But then Yahweh's questions which introduce his second speech would bear down on us. If we were to object this way, we'd have to start answering God's questions. If we, who cannot save ourselves, in chapter 40, verse 14, if we can't enforce our will and humble the proud, verse 11, if we can't adorn ourselves with that terrifying majesty, in which God goes to war against evil, then what makes us so certain of the rightness of our opinions about how the world should be run? We can't even bear the sight of this monster. Our complete inability to rule as only the divine warrior can casts doubt on our objections to his plan. And Job, in any case, doesn't object this way. He accepts God's plan for his world on God's terms in ignorant faith a faith which allows him to see God in an entirely new way. It's worth noting that the supernatural interpretation of the figure of Leviathan is not vulnerable to the objections listed above against a naturalistic reading. It explains why there is a second speech. Uh, it becomes clear why Job reacts differently. He sees Yahweh in the sense that he gains a new insight about Yahweh, and how Yahweh will one day engage with Leviathan. This is why Job despises himself. He comes to realize that he's been criticizing the only person who can save him. Supernatural reading explains why Yahweh shows up on the scene in full battle armor. And finally, this interpretation brings the second divine speech more closely into contact with the issue of innocent suffering. Now, a final benefit is that it allows the reader to identify the Leviathan at the end of the book with the Satan at the beginning of the book. 
the, Satan shows up and gets this whole tragedy rolling, and then he just disappears. He's not talked about anymore. I don't know if Job and ancient Israelites would have made this connection, but for those of us who can read the book of Re Revelation, John makes reference to that ancient serpent who is the accuser. Helps us read this book better. Whatever its advantages, the present line of argument has one objection. Why is the battle only hinted at in this passage? Other descriptions in the Old Testament of the divine warrior's engagement with chaos give great attention to the battle itself. In striking contrast, God spends much of chapter 41 praising his opponent. If the main point Yahweh wishes Job to infer from the speech concerns, Yahweh's, concerns Leviathan's eventual defeat, why not say this more clearly? I believe the reason for this is found in the overall rhetorical goals of chapters 38 through 42. Yahweh is recommending his particular manner of governing creation, allowing some evil, limited, and temporary agency in the midst of much good. And Yahweh is encouraging Job to accept creation on God's terms rather than wishing for creation's dissolution, as he did in chapter 3. Even though Yahweh will bring his sword near to Behemoth, for instance, Behemoth still ranks highly with his creator. He's the first of God's ways. Yahweh seems to rejoice in the task before him as ruler over a sometimes rebellious creation. Will Job rejoice with him? The rhetorical aim of these passages draws the focus away from the battle and toward the present state of the world before the battle. The world Job still has to live, with, live in, in which Leviathan is still free. Job wants to con Yahweh wants to convince Job to re-engage fully with creation as Yahweh orders it. The final chapter of the book shows that Yahweh does so. So finally, in conclusion, the subject of Yahweh's second speech to Job should be, refer, should be understood to refer to a supernatural monster and not an animal. Although this is a minority opinion among commentators, interpreting Leviathan in harmony with his other appearances in the Old Testament allows for a more satisfying conclusion to the book of Job. From this perspective, the question of innocent suffering is given a more direct, if not complete, answer. Modern-day Western Christians live in a cultural environment far removed from Job's, and so the symbols by which Yahweh communicates to his scarred servant are not obvious to us. But the promise of the book of Job is not limited to one culture. When those who trust Yahweh suffer like Job, out of proportion to what they deserve, and I, I know that we all deserve nothing but death and judgment from God. When I say that, I mean Job has been living a sincerely Right? He's a man of integrity before God. He's enjoyed many years, and then out of nowhere, his life falls apart. This disproportionate, unexplained suffering, when we suffer in that way, the witness of the book of Job encourages us to trust God's present administration of creation, which sometimes allows for grotesque suffering waiting for the day when God finally defeats the powers on high. Indeed, the book of Job expands our horizons by showing us that when we suffer, we're caught up in a war in heaven over whether humans will hold on to a relationship with God when it starts to cost them everything to do so. Further, when we, like Job, though scarred and still ignorant, continue to trust God and his way of governing, governing the present order of things, we are promised new insight into God, which far outstrips everything we've known of him so far. And we can say, now my eyes have seen you. Thank you, everyone. Friends, it hasn't been exactly three minutes, but none of you are leaving, so do you want to just go to the questions now? What do you say? Okay. I, I warn you that, that as a professor, I've, I've fine-tuned really complicated and intelligent-sounding intelligent ways to say I don't know, so you may, you may be getting those, some of those from me. But are, are there any questions? Andrea. Okay. I'm very ignorant about this. So, forgive me for so am I. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so we're talking about the two passages. Yeah. So basically, I wonder why they say kind of the same thing. Is there any sort of criticism that thinks and narrator put those two together? And it's, I guess, like the same speech? 
Oh, that it, sorry, that it is, has there been, has it been suggested that it was originally the same speech and then yeah. split up? Um, um, yeah, ha yeah, a number of scholars have suggested that maybe originally it was just chapters 38 and 39 and then 40 and 41 got tacked on on the end. My guess is probably you could find somewhere who's, somewhere someone who's hypothesized that it was originally one speech. Probably. I'm not sure that really solves much to go that way. Yeah, is Kevin. there much extra biblical evidence about the Hema, or is that because you didn't really go into yeah. detail on uh, that? That's good. For any of you who might not have heard, the question is, what about Behemoth? Is there any extra biblical evidence for him? Uh, there isn't, uh, but Robert File wrote a book uh, called Now My Eyes Have Seen You, in which he talks about there are points in the description of Behemoth that, that resemble the god Death in the Ugaritic Baal epic, Mot. Um, there are a number of interesting overlaps there. It's not explicit, but there seem to be some pretty strong echoes. If so, then it's, it's well, it reminds me of Jesus saying the gates of death and hell will not prevail against this rock. It's death and hell together, Behemoth and Leviathan. But no, you can't find anyone specifically named Behemoth in other, in other texts. Oh, good. I can go then. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Does it have to be an either or? Like, I, I there not a lot of places in scripture where hmm, it's nearly a double meaning. Yeah. But you have one level and then there's another level beyond that. Sure. Could it not be a reference to a natural animal which has a, a higher meaning? Sure. The, the question is. Could, could, does it have to be an either or? Couldn't it be an animal and have a supernatural dimension to it as well? Um, and, um, oh, I'm going to forget his name. Hart, John Hartley in the Nicot series takes that view. He takes, it, he takes God to be taking about an animal and to be basically doing an, an Old Testament kind of demonology as well. Um, I, I don't have any particular strong objection to that. I just don't see what's gained by God talking about a crocodile here. Um, it, so, may I ask a second question? Sure, of course. Is the reference to a crocodile, have we inserted that? Is it actually a crocodile, or could it not be an extinct something? Uh, that's a good question. Strictly speaking, it's a seven-headed snake. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a possibility. I can't rule that out. Can I Eric? Ask a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Eric and then Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> Eric? Uh, yeah, I just I ran into a, a good friend of mine this summer who's struggling tremendously with his faith. He's uh, got a couple of boys, both of them very little, yeah. and he can't reconcile the fact that children are treated in the most unspeakable yeah. and awful ways, and how God can permit that and yeah. be just. So there's a different <coughs> level of emotional engagement with a grown man, yeah. all of his kids are killed, which is unspeakable. Yeah. And then children, innocent, treated in a certain way. Does, is there some help to be found there in, in this? Yeah. The, 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 the question is for, for a friend who's really struggling with the unimaginably horrible things that God allows to happen in the world. I, I don't know what to say from the book of Job, except God acknowledges that that is unimaginable. In fact, God sees the true dimensions of that suffering in a way that we never can. And God promises he will not always let that happen. M most children are, are not treated in those unimaginable ways. That's unusual. He does allow it sometimes. And if, if your friend starts to push back and says, no, it is simply wrong for God to do that, God should never let anything go wrong with creation, then the questions start to come back. You start to, then the questions God asks start to come back. And I'm not saying you should say this, but if he's reading the book of Job, it would be, you can't even fathom the amount of evil out there. And you want to say that you know better how the world could be run? You can't even put your hand on Leviathan. And you're going to claim that you know better than God. Really? That's not a complete answer. 
And yet, when people say, okay, I don't know why, but I trust God's way of running things, they start to see God as God in a whole new way. Kevin? Um, just on a technical question. Yeah. Uh, are, are we pretty sure about the connection between Leviathan and the, the seven-headed twist in the serpent, Lotan and the, the Uri? Yes. Yeah, he, he's called Leviathan there. So uh, you, you, you smoke Lotan, the fleeing serpent, the twisting serpent, the ruler with seven heads. So. I didn't know the, the, the connection between Lotan and oh. the Hebrew word are the same. Right, they're, they're not identical, um, but yeah, they were pronounced differently, but yeah, they, they are the same words. Yeah. When I say Lotan in the paper, that's my guess as to how it's pronounced. No one really knows. Yeah. So uh, from this, I'm understanding Leviathan can be taken in context of like evil, I guess, in as a whole. But then from ancient Hebrew uh, custom, would they have understood it? Like, would Job have understood Leviathan to be specifically the beast that Baal fights? Right. Or would he have understood the greater context of that? Right. That that's a good question. If anyone didn't hear it, the question is would would Job have understood <coughs> Leviathan to be the same as the monster that Baal fights? Would he have had exactly the same understanding we would have? Um, and yeah, I I don't know. I, I can't for certain say that. At the same time, there seems to have been a common stock of tradition from the ancient Middle East that the Bible references and makes you, you know, makes use of. Job himself refers to Leviathan in, in chapter 3. He says in chapter 7, am I the sea that God would wage war against me? So he seems to have that category in his thought. <coughs> so I, I, you know, I take it that when God uses those categories, he's speaking within Job's cultural context. I haven't been called a heretic yet. This is this is <laughs> encouraging. <laughs> and <laughs> not out loud anyway. Nothing's been thrown at me. Any other questions? Okay, well th thank you all for coming. Just one last word before we uh, thank Kirk again. This is the first in our series of colloquiums. The next one, stay tuned for November 16, where our seminary professor David Goretsky will be speaking, I think, on charismatic hope and political appreciation appreciation of Karl Barth's resistance to universalism. So that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm.